Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Alexis, and thanks for this nice introduction. Uh, well, my name is Claudia Nunez Pacheco. Uh, I am a researcher and postdoctoral researcher uh, at the Digital Futures and also at MIT. And my talk is entitled Foreignness as a Conceptual Standpoint for the Design of Interactive Systems. Um, and before starting, I would like to start with this little phrase that's there uh, next to the box about this idea of thinking outside the box. And it's this sort of directing values that sort of influences my research. Uh, basically, subjectivity in design is important. And I will repeat this concept throughout the presentation. And why is that important? Uh, well, design is an activity that basically has been around before Industrial Revolution, although uh, starting from that point, it became marketed. And lots of interesting things were designed and useful things before uh, the arrival of the Industrial Revolution and even today. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was this paper on autobiographical design. And I think it was published in Kai, probably, that it was talking about how some designers engage in the design of interactive systems that were useful for, for themselves. And yeah, it's like a sort of a taboo topic, thinking about subjectivity, because obviously design wants to be like science. Okay, so we want to follow certain steps and for us it's important to sort of systematize processes. Uh, in order to obtain validity. So here I have a nice example. I really like this framework by Kruppi and Lexpik that, yeah, sorry about my appalling pronunciation. <laughs> I talked about this framework for empathy in design. So there is this idea that we have to first sort of look from the outside and then engage. So you have here, it has different uh, stages. So you the designer here that's a curious detail, he, he or she got some glasses. Can you see it has the letter D? So the designer who has this sort of scientific gaze looks from the outside, okay? It discovers what is happening with the user and then it connects and gets immersed into the user's uh, work. And then sort of detaches as well. And with all the knowledge that he or she got is able to analyze experience from the outside and then to connect deeply. But that's, um, although um, I have been teaching user-centered design, human-centered design for a long time, and I do appreciate these techniques and I love them and I love teaching them. I think it's important to be critical as well uh, because in a certain way, uh, there is something from the designer that still remains there. And all this premise that uh, design sort of detaches from the user it also uh, responds to this idea that design is a universal activity. And the things that we do through user research is basically we, we get universal results. That's not necessarily the case. So I was talking to my colleagues uh, a week ago about this idea of the furniture. I am more on the smaller side of, let's say I'm a Latino woman, I'm not that tall. And sometimes I have issues with furniture and sometimes they are comfortable, but I'm pretty sure that my experience with furniture resonates with other people. And it comes from subjective experience. So having said that, uh, speaking a little bit about myself, uh, my background is uh, design, as you can have noticed. I am a designer. I used to study graphic design a long time ago, and then I did interaction design. I am super interested in the intersections between art and science, uh, engineering and arts. I'm drawn to the humanities, to the social sciences. So I would say that my interest lays on sort of, a, of this rough edge between disciplines. And that's a little bit problematic because you're always an outsider. So you never sort of, you commit deeply to your research obviously, but it's always a little bit dangerous. Oh, that's what I think, and I like to think it in that way. Uh, so this idea of being unfamiliar sort of gives you a fresh perspective on things. And here's when this idea of foreignness comes as a concept. Because yeah, as, um, as my presentation indicates, this, this is a conceptual framework or a conceptual idea. Um, again, from a personal perspective, um, <laughs> Hopefully this is not too boring. Uh, 
I am a foreigner and I did my PhD in Australia where I was also a foreigner. And I had this realization because being a foreigner brings lots of uh, tensions, but also lots of joy. So I realized that the state of the foreignness of being a foreigner or being an outsider or being at the edge is a state of mind that is actually allows you to see things differently. And I'd like to think of this as in a state of mind of being a permanent outsider in a globalized world. And yes, it has to be with this idea of being far away from home, but it also has to be with this ideas of belonging to a less represented way of thinking or maybe something that's strange or something that's an outsider from a broader perspective. And yeah, although I was, I, I, I enjoyed and I cherish my time in Australia and I'm super, I love the city and I also enjoyed my time in my country. When I, I went back, for example, after doing my PhD, I felt detached and I suffer from reverse cultural shock, which is a thing actually. So it was this idea of, okay, how if you get in peace with the idea that you're not gonna be an insider? So it's like I'm receiving this idea with enthusiasm because it's liberating, okay? Um, but what happens is that, um, oh, okay. So as a related to this idea of way of thinking, uh, I like to think of foreignness as uh, one of the six thinking hats. I don't know if you know this technique, which is when you evaluate certain design ideas. So let's say we're gonna design new um, ways of engaging with the public transport. And so depending on the hat that you put on your head, and you start thinking has that specific, uh, let's say prototype or um, archetype, that's the word that I was looking for. So let's say the black hat is, okay, my uh, state of mind is as a cautious person. So how about the budget? And the green one is the creative, but what if we, I don't know, paint the public transport or the buses with white dots, something like that. Okay, uh, so when I was, um, Thinking of this idea of being a foreigner, being an outsider, that's not completely new. It comes from phenomenology as well. Uh, I stumbled upon this concept of otherness a couple of years ago. Actually a year ago, yeah. Uh, and I really like this idea of the otherness, being the other. It brings like this sort of a, a special flavor. However, um, Otherness is a term that has been widely used in the social sciences. And generally um, it's related with this idea of the dom having a dominant group. And then you have the other. So the self, the us, and the others like a stigmatized dominated group. And it's not what I want to say. So this idea of being a foreigner, being far away from home is actually empowering. It's nice, it's a little bit crazy, but this idea of being like um, sort of dominated and stigmatized, it's a bit problematic. So uh, regarding um, this idea of stigmatizing, uh, and stigma is just half of the truth. It's not completely like wrong, but the problem is that those half truth, uh, people get fixated with those. So it's, it's not useful. So I wanted to think of another, let's say concept and foreignness, although it's ongoing and I might change it and I think it's, it sort of gets away and escapes from this idea of being the dominated group. And speaking about being the other and being we and being they, uh, I'd like to give uh, an example from critical design. So um, for those who are not designers, critical design is it's interesting because uh, there were this group of designers that one day decided to just stop designing uh, according to the requirements of the market and said, okay, you know, we will create a new design field maybe or current if you want to look at it in that way. Let's sort of think of possible futures. So what if we, for example, um, I don't know, we faced a, a nuclear war in the future or what if we are lacking, we, we run out of oxygen, let's say. So uh, this idea was to specul speculate on future scenarios and start designing systems and products that would address all those questions. 
And it's interesting because now you say how objects encapsulate knowledge that are not necessarily connected to an immediate reality, which is really cool. So here I'm putting this example uh, called the Faraday share. That's a super classic example that protects you from electromagnetic, electromagnetic fields. Uh, but it's not a chair, right? It's interesting. But then I came across this example um, that's interesting. The Republic of Salivation um, that was conceived by a um, designer from the UK. My apologies, I don't remember the names now. And they came across with this concept of the Republic of Salivation, which was exhibited at MoMA in 2011, where they created all this sort of dystopic uh, fantasy. And I'll read a little bit. So it says that um, the Republic of Salivation starts with the food shortages and famine we will face in the future. Take note of this. As a famine we will face in the future. That's important detail. So governments will be forced to ration food through restricted food policies to ensure that everyone is fed and to control social unrest. So the idea is that the type of food they receive is carefully designed to the emotional, intellectual, and physical demands of their job. So we have here some of the packages they designed um, that were basically containing starch. So they were blocks that you had to consume within a certain time frame, and they were um, provided by the government. But okay, so the, this thing is super cool. But I think that it sort of touches this concept of being the other and we. You know what I mean. It's not a dystopic fantasy to think of a world that is lacking of resources. There are some places in the world, and that's one of the critiques that this work received, where um, lack of food is a reality, actually. Um, so yeah, it's interesting how this idea of it's not gonna happen to us is also harmful. Uh, we can think, for example, of COVID, what is happening now, I never, in, even in my like wildest dreams, I imagine I, that I would be living through a pandemic, and it's happening, you know. So I think that this idea of splitting this idea of we and the others is is a bad idea, especially for how things are turning out. Okay, so necessarily I have to talk about defamiliarization, this idea of being a familiar to one place. It's also related to this idea of taking things from home or taking things from their natural environment and moving them somewhere else. So I'm putting this image here by, by Marcel Duchamp that was created, uh, created the fountain, which is, it shouldn't be 2017, though, but well, a little mistake. Uh, so uh, Marcel Duchamp created this piece of art, which is a, well, it's a bloody urinal. <laughs> But the interesting thing is how this urinal, which is a super trivial object, is sort of the meaning is, is transformed into something else because it belongs now to an art gallery. So you start seeing things differently and it changes the meaning totally. It's how like simple things or how trivial things can become elevated by sort of moving our changing the position and the way that we understand things. Okay. Um, so, uh, from uh, what happens with interactive systems, because I have been talking about all, all this conceptual thing, but uh, what's going on, how it relates to, to the topic of digital technologies. So there are certain uh, fields of designs or currents or movements that have emerged. And one of them is Soma design that's happening here at KTH with uh, Kia Hook. And it's absolutely great. So they are doing uh, Soma design, which basically um, uses first person perspective as a different way of doing design. design. And different in the sense that it sort of, um, it differs from the predominant paradigm that's user-centered design and all this idea of, of validity, etc. So it's this idea of getting more in contact with the body and recognizing and appreciating basically the rhythms of life. That's important. 
Here I have uh, another example uh, by Daniel Wild and his team, Anna Bagorda and Oscar Tomiko. They um, run a series of workshops and this one was the last one, I think, um, which is embodied design ideation methods, analyzing the power of estrangement. So by defamiliarization, I also mean, mean estrangement, which is other way of naming this concept of making things strange. So what they do or what they did was to gather different design methods and start testing them out uh, in order to ambition new ways to design technologies closer to the body, uh, involving movement and that could be useful and taking that, that could take into account those aspects. Uh, same with this classic one, body storming. Uh, lots of designers use them. Uh, use it. Uh, basically, what you do is rather than thinking, okay, I will make some sketches on how is the sleeping in airplanes, let's say. Okay, we'll gather with the team and we'll think of all the uncomfortable things uh, involved in that exercise we just enacted. So we use uh, office furniture and we engage in this conversation by using our bodies. And this is a necessary exercise because although we all know that traveling uh, by plane can be can be uncomfortable, messy, uh, even smelly, whatever you want. Uh, but sometimes by engaging physically, you start discovering other things that you tend to take for granted. And that's the idea of defamiliarization is taking what is taken for granted and looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, this is another method, uh, moving and making strange. This is a uh, whole methodology uh, created by Leanne Loke during her PhD. And it's super interesting as well in the sense that it uses this idea of moving and making strange uh, by observing movement from the first per person perspective to design interactive systems for the lived body. And this methodology that it's comprised by several methods um, acknowledges the point of view of the, the person, the body, um, the machine, and also the observer. Okay, so um, now I'll refer to a case study, uh, which is, this is a design method called designer, designing from the grantor's experience. So by the grantor, I mean, this is something that I created, is something that gave me a piece of her experience. I know it sounds strange. Uh, I will explain how I obtained it. And from that standpoint, that's really subjective, I created something. I designed something for her and for others to get a sense or a piece of her experience. Uh, if you want to read more, but not for now, certainly, um, I just received the good news that the paper talking about this, the whole system was approved uh, a week ago. So it's gonna be soon available at the Journal of Digital Creativity, if you want to read more. Okay, so uh, during my PhD, I was looking for things to use our bodies as a way to access embodied knowledge for design and the design of interactive systems. And uh, I was really interested in this idea of the intuition of how our body knows things well and our super binary way of understanding things. We tend to think that mind and body are separated. Maybe that's a little bit commonsensical what I'm about to say, but it's not necessarily the case. It's not like that. And I'll give you an example. So I really like this photo. And you might recognize Simone de Beauvoir, who is looking at, she's writing something. She's having a cup of tea, I assume. And she's staring at the nothingness, probably. She's like searching. So let's imagine that she is looking for a word that's missing. So she's writing one of her essays. And then she wants to say something, but she forgot the word. It's just like, oh, I don't remember this word. Which could that be? It happens to us as well, right? It's when you write a paper or yeah, if you like writing poetry, let's say, 
sometimes you forget things and you forget the words. All right, so it's like, okay, uh, what's that word? And you cannot come up with that. And you feel that this terrible discomfort. It's physical, it's like, it can be. I mean, I'm not able to remember that word. I'm pretty sure that it's like in the tip of my tongue. And you know that's there, but it's in the edge between your conscious and your conscious mind. And you feel super uncomfortable. And you say, okay, it doesn't matter. I have to keep going. So I'll put a replacement word that sort of matches all the things that I'm feeling now, that I'm sort of, I know what I'm feeling, but I'm just unable to articulate it through a specific word. Okay, so you place that another word that you are missing and you keep writing. But still that discomfort is there, this bloody discomfort is like, no, I mean, no, I can't keep working. I, it's, it's super hard to get inspiration if I'm not like coming up with the word that I was trying to say. It's not precise enough. And then, Voila, the word was, let's say, intuition. And you write it and there is this sort of relief and you can keep going with your life. Okay, so that's an example that our body knows our situation. The body knows first, even though it's like, and, and yeah, that's getting personal again, but it's part of the talk as well, I guess. Every time that you have to make a decision and you have analyzed everything, you have analyzed every aspect of it, you sort of, okay, you have everything clear, right? But again, if you're not very sure about what to do because you know that both options are good or equally bad, just follow your gut because your body sort of knows, you know, stuff they are not able to articulate. So I was looking for ways to actually take out this tacit knowledge that you can see here through this image and try to bring it to the outside through insights. Okay, I'm looking at the clock, that's fine. So the idea was to bring all this tacit knowledge through the outside and make it explicit. Um, so in design, this idea of the insights, especially user-centered design, yeah, it's, a, it's a relevant idea, I would say. So we want to get insight from our users. So analyze what they say and try to get to the core of the situation. But here, uh, by using certain techniques or connecting with the body in this case, connecting with that discomfort, you can certainly reach to this eureka moment and reach to those insights, okay? So I call, actually it wasn't me, I will explain that later in the next slide possibly. Uh, that discomfort, the sort of a repertoire of feelings, sensations, memories, all this complex whole is called the felt sense. So you have several felt senses that are sort of this collection of things that are there in your tacit knowledge or actually these are in, I'll show this, this one at the edge of articulation. So you have the felt sense here, which is at a liminal space between being unconscious and conscious. And when you sort of connect with the body, this insight emerges and the meaning because becomes acknowledged. Okay, so back. So what I did was, okay, this is great. I want to use this idea for design because we want to get insights from others we want to get uh, creative ideas, or even we want to evaluate prototypes and we want to get real candid uh, accounts from our users or our participants. So I came across uh, this technique uh, created by a philosopher and a phenomenologist called uh, Eugene Gendling. Uh, well, he passed away a couple of years ago and his ideas are super sophisticated. Um, he created, created this technique that's called focusing uh, because he noticed that it's possible to access meaning through the body because the body is the interface in the articulation of meaning. So this idea of bringing outside. And this technique is uh, currently used in psychotherapy. So what you did is, uh, as in any of those somatic techniques, 
or soma, I refer by soma, the body and all that involves. In all these techniques that use the body as a door for the articulation of meaning, uh, you close your eyes, you start feeling, you get sensitized first, and then we sort of engage with certain specific topic, let's say our childhood, or even I tried this technique in the context of a master's studio class uh, to design healthy workplaces. So we uh, came up with, we, we sort of focused on the idea of being in the office and the idea was to start feeling what are your real impressions and how to improve it. And interesting ideas emerge from discoveries. So, and next, yeah, I already showed you this. So the advantages of using this protocol of focusing that was created by Gendling, there are plenty. Yeah, easy to use, uh, you don't need like special equipment. Uh, you don't need a facilitator. Uh, so when I was doing my PhD, <laughs> this is an interesting story. I went to, to see a group of people that practiced focusing and to ask them for their collaboration and they were, weren't interested. So I, I joined, them, joined them and I started studying focusing myself. So uh, I became proficient in this technique. So, but the most important thing is that you get uh, detailed descriptions, you get into the source of the discomfort, you get into this repertoire of lots of things that emerge and that are at the edge of meaning articulation, including felt senses. So I wanted to get all those detailed descriptions to design. Okay, so what I did was, okay, I started to apply this technique uh, during user research um, uh, studies. So the first thing I did was trying with, uh, how about if I used, uh, if I use the focusing technique in combination with uh, little props and devices that sort of would sort of potentially amplify or diminish or change the quality of the effects. And so here, there are some devices that you can see in the photo that uses vibration motors on the contact with, with, with the chest where is the, this discomfort is generally felt. And also I uh, use some um, elements to transmit heat on the chest and it also resulted in a series of uh, results. So in some cases, the sensation was intensified. In other cases, the sensations were diminished and other qualities emerged. So if you want to know, yeah, actually in like in an one and a half hour, I'm giving another talk at UAC, a conference talking about um, the result of this study. Okay, so after collecting all this information, because what I did was going through focusing, asking people to sort of uh, use these devices to sort of amplify or place it on the area of the body they feel the emergence of the felt sense, I also asked them to note down their impressions within a time frame of 10 minutes. So the idea is that during the time frame, they wouldn't be rationalizing or thinking that much about the things that they were noting down, but it's more like revealing raw, raw from the source very quickly. So after I collected all these impressions, um, I uh, developed this uh, public installation called Soul. Uh, that this one emerged from a user study session where I asked them, I asked me my participants through private interviews to come up with a blissful memory uh, as a design material. No, not as a design material, a blissful memory. So we went through focusing to sort of try to identify why it was blissful. And this person offered me a super nice account on a way on, on on a moment that she went to, she started remembering an occasion where she went to uh, attended a code drumming session, a Japanese code drumming session. Do you know Japanese code drumming? So Japanese drumming are the super huge drums that the musicians sort of start. Um, it, it generates like super um, vibrating sound that's super deep and huge. So here, uh, this is her description. She describes how the concert hall was dark and silent and the sense of anticipation of 
the performance of Japanese code drumming. She was ecstatic with this idea and, and the vibration started gently and it was gradually building up. So the vibration was loud as a thunder at the end. Okay, so, and she also described how she was placing the device on the chest and she felt connectedness and intensified and it was pleasant, etc. So, what I did was, okay, I'm taking this piece of experience with me and I will create something that sort of represents parts of what her experience is encapsulating for others to share. But the strat strategy was because I am an oppositionist. Well, not necessarily, <laughs> that's not the case, but I thought, okay, so I'll avoid this idea of co-designing as a way to promote disagreement. Because I thought if I invite my participant, if I invite her to design this piece with me, she's gonna get attached too quickly. So what I want to do is to offer her a, a functional prototype that's working. And then she would say, eh, I don't like this, I don't, I don't like that. In that way, I am using the prototype as a projective artifact. Okay. So, uh, what else? So, what I did was I used a research to design methodology, this constructive design. Uh, I also used this facilitated interaction framework, which where I guided my participants through different stages. I interviewed my participants, uh, and the sessions lasted forty minutes each. Uh, during a frame, framework of a three-day exhibition. So here's um, the structure of the experience. So people would enter to the reception room. They would go through a relaxation exercise involving focusing as well to, I, I, I would ask them to, to actually sort of think of a moment of lease. So to get into the mood and then they would go through the installation room. So here is what you could see. I don't know if you're able to, so this is working well. Okay, so the installation was basically a mat uh, that had vibration models from head to toe and the participant could listen to the story, to a piece of uh, story that was narrated through headphones. By the way, the only thing that I asked my participant was to record her voice because I wanted to get this candidness of her account. So we'll listen to a little fragment of what the participants could actually listen, including uh, my user's story. Okay, my participant's story. Every time when the, the, the drumming would be coupled with vibration in the back. I felt the vibrations in the air, in my chest, in my arms and legs, in my feet and in my hands. I felt an overwhelming joy inside. It felt like my spirit was moved. I felt I was one with the vibration, with the air, the chair on which I was sitting, with the dramas, with the entire whole. I felt connected on an atomic level. I felt I'm a part of the whole. Okay, so th this was a little fragment. And so the idea was that you would have some drumming sounds and then uh, you would listen to her account and in this sort of dark contemplative state. Here, okay. So this is another view of the installation. And this is another one. Okay, so uh, this is the method, like sort of wrapping up what all, all I did and to explain in one place how the method, method worked. So the idea was that um, I was interested in extracting uh, the grantors or in this case, my participants aesthetic experiencing. Okay, so the most predominant um, traits of her experience by means of collecting 
I collected her descriptions through this reading piece that I would ask to complete after the focusing session. Then I would take this description and identify those aesthetic qualities that were um, more easily transferable. Uh, this is a sort of a filtering out process. Then I would represent uh, what I uh, sort of extracted from the synthesis through the device or the prototype, which, which is an exercise of trying to take values and encapsulating it into the artifact. And then I call the evaluate the, the grantor and other participants to evaluate and how they felt and if it makes sense between the vibration, what they were feeling, and if they were immersed or if they got part of the aesthetic experience of the grantor. And here are some results. So uh, the results were super interesting in the sense that most people felt like being in a theater because this piece uses the power of suggestion, obviously. So having the eyes closed, having access to sort of fragmented uh, experiencing also allows your brain and your body to complete with meaning. Uh, three people actually felt like being her, like being the grantor, which is like I, I stopped being myself and I was this person and I was totally in it. And that's great. Something interesting as well, when I tested out this uh, artifact with the grantor, with the participant, with, with the person who inspired the creation of this prototype, she said, okay, this was great. I really enjoyed it. I think that you captured what I was trying to say. However, I felt that this immensity, all this sort of this thunder-ish uh, experience, this, um, because it started like super gently, like the drumming, and then it became as loud as a thunder in and it shook her body. That's what the, um, the written description says. She said, this sort of, this super immense thing was missing. And my body was craving for more. Okay, that's great. For the next version, I'll take that into account. But she wasn't the only person who said that. So the people who, was, uh, who felt or embodied this state as being there, some of them also felt like, okay, this is great, but my body was craving for more. We suggest, this, this is, I know that it's super subjective and it's just a suggestion that something connects us uh, beyond all this sort of explicit, um, um, there's something implicit that connects us as human beings. There's something inherently similar amongst us uh, in spite of our differences. And because uh, <laughs> I'm super interested in this particular group that was a minority anyway, Although I received some other comments from the upper group, there were people that they were super upset and um, annoyed by the installation. The reason um, they, they, they knew that this installation was a piece of a blissful experience by someone. And they were like, there was this woman that said, you know, it's like, I don't want you over there. This is not my happy place. I don't like this idea that this is so noisy so dark and my happy place is totally the opposite. My happy place is as luminous, is surrounded by nature, is surrounded with my family, my friends. This is not, I don't want to be there. Honestly, for me, it was such an uncomfortable experience. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's great. Tell me more. <laughs> and this was in another person who said, okay, same thing. I don't want to get into this. And it brought me some bad experiences and I don't like her accent. And I found this so controversial, but at the same time, it's so great to have the access to uh, these super candid expressions of opinions, you know. Uh, so this is as a summary of the results. Um, I have a similar framework um, somewhere else uh, in my first paper that I wrote in 2014 um, called uh, Crafting the Body Tool, something else. That this is a sort of a framework that explain how actually you engage or embody, uh, you, you bodily engage with this kind of uh, interfaces or devices that interact directly with your body. 
So in this case, what happened was that when you have this dialogue with the artifact, two things can happen. First, that the meaning generation is not achieved because you got distracted, etc. That's not the case here. And then when the embodied engagement happens, three possible things occur. The first one is mirroring the self, the assertion. It's like, yes, I was this person during the interaction. I was her. The second one is, okay, I connected by, uh, because the installation offered meaningful handles. In that case is, okay, this experience reminded me of myself attending to other concepts. And the third one is when the piece works as a projective artifact. In this case, it scaffolds new meaning. I'm not saying that in the other cases it, it, it doesn't happen because this is not as, but in this case, it allows people to dissent and to say, I don't like this place. My happy place is full of light. It's not dark, etc." And then I was thinking, okay, uh, this, this installation or an structuring that's similar to this, it would be great to actually test out and to try to represent or to give pieces of experience of two underrepresented voices or those, those voices that don't belong to the we but belongs to the other. Uh, and this is a good example of what happens actually. When you have an experience that is so out there and it's so okay, it's so subjective that it's not, it's very difficult to just go away with it. It's, you have to assume a position about it. And I want to conclude with this uh, reflection. Um, this is gonna be part of, I will be working with uh, foreigner communities, etc. But I like this idea of empowering difference. So um, I just want to conclude with this phrase that tension and disagreement offer opportunities for meaningful dialogues. And, and it's gonna be super important to this to design for a world uh, full of differences and unpredictable scenarios. And personal testimonies will become part of our new normality. Okay. So uh, hopefully this went well, technically speaking, uh, and thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>